Welcome to Advanced Data Analysis 1 with me, Eric Ehrhardt, Professor of Statistics at the University of New Mexico. In this video, we will continue Chapter 8, and we'll talk about the correlation coefficient, testing whether it's equal to zero or not, and uh, start into linear regression. So here we are at Chapter 8. Uh, please download the R code and run it along as you're reading the lecture notes and following along. So in the last video at the beginning, we talked about the correlation coefficient. In fact, if I scroll up there for a moment, we discussed um, estimating the correlation coefficient using the covariance and the standard deviations of both the X and Y uh, data. And we discussed some properties as, and showed a few plots about how to, um, what correlations of different magnitudes look like. And also we made the case that uh, correlation equals zero does not mean that there's no association, but it, because correlation only measures linear association, there may be a nonlinear association that is not being picked up. So if I scroll on back to section 8.3, we're now getting into hypothesis testing, and the most common hypothesis that we're interested in testing with respect to the correlation coefficient is whether the population correlation equals zero, or whether it's different from zero, that it's either positive or negative. So we've got two features, x and y, that we are measuring. And we learned how to estimate the correlation in a, earlier, uh, the part I just scrolled up to. And from there, we can uh, derive, or someone else has done this for us, uh, a t-statistic for the correlation. And notice it's quite a funky uh, formula. It's the sample size minus 2. Uh, the minus 2 here is that we have to estimate the mean for both the x variable and the y variable. So we lose 2 degrees of freedom estimating the mean. But from there we can estimate r, and we also have in the denominator 1 minus r squared. So we calculate this and we get a t-statistic. Notice that the r squared inside must always be positive since whether it's a positive or negative number, when you square it, it will be positive. But on the outside, because we have an r by itself, with r being positive or negative, that will determine whether t is positive or negative. And from there, we can use uh, this statistic follows a t distribution with n minus 2 degrees of freedom. And from there, we can do the standard hypothesis um, we can use a st standard hypothesis testing framework to determine whether or not uh, this t-statistic is extreme enough, measured by the p-value being small, to reject the null in favor of the alternative. All right. So there are assumptions with every statistical test. In particular, testing whether correlation is equal to zero or not assumes that our random sample of x and y come from a bivariate normal distribution. Effectively, that means that we should have a cloud of points that is roughly elliptical in space. And so if I page up for a moment to the data that were simulated for these plots, all of these plots except for the, the curve at the bottom right are would meet the assumptions for bivariate normality. There's roughly an elliptical curve that the data fall into. Uh, furthermore, if you project this data and just look at the x-axis or just look at the y-axis for a set of data, you will see roughly normal distributions for both of the margins. All right, scrolling back down. All right, so that is um, uh, that. There's another correlation coefficient called the Spearman correlation coefficient, and which does not require bivariate normality. So because the Pearson correlation can be highly influenced by outliers, just as a standard t-test would for a one-sample or two-sample test, uh, for example, imagine we have got this cloud of points in the top left, and then we have one extreme outlier. So imagine what the correlation is without the outlier. 
it's pretty much a horizontal line, so the correlation would be zero. But when you include this point, uh, there's now this strong negative relationship that effectively goes, you know, if you were to draw a line through this data, it would effectively go through the center of the points on the left and close to the point on the bottom right. That would be a very strong relationship. Obviously, you, in this case, you probably want to investigate that point and ask what's up and possibly remove it as not being very representative, perhaps. So in this case, um, you know, in the plot below, we have a correlation that's going to be close to minus 1. And so what should we do if we want to include all of the points, but we don't want to be sensitive to extreme observations? So that is where the Spearman correlation comes from. And it's called the rank correlation because the correlations that we estimate are effectively estimated by the ranks of the data rather than the actual values. So to give uh, some intuition here, rather than to worry specifically about what the actual calculations are, imagine taking the data and calculating the ranks of the values first. Okay, so uh, let's see if this, this data may not be quite, uh, might not be super easy to to look at, but let's try. So within within the date x direction, we would convert these data to ranks. So we just go in the order of the data, and count one, two, three, four, five. So this first point on the far left would be one. The second point would be two. This and this is where I may I may not be able to select individual points. Nope. The third point would be three, and so on. So we go all the way through. Maybe there's 99 points. Just say. And then this would be the 100th point out there. So now we've converted our data from the actual values, which are sort of like negative 1 to positive 1, roughly, and then 10. We've taken those actual values and we've converted them from to the integers 1 to 100. And then we're going to do the same thing for the y direction, from low to high. So this is the first value. And then the second value is eh, maybe impossible to select, <laughs> but I think you get the point. The next one down and then the third four five six and you start ranking all, them all the way up to the top one maybe this is the, the top one at number 100 and then you calculate the correlation based on the ranks instead of the actual numbers what that does is it eliminates the distances between points and sets them instead to equal intervals uh, equal unit intervals so the distance between say in the y direction that point number one and whatever the second point is, let's call that one number two, is equal to the second point and the third point. So we've removed the dependency on distance, instead favoring ranks. And so that removes the dependency then on the distance between points and makes outliers less influential. That's the intuition behind the Spearman correlation. Uh, it is a it is a non-parametric strategy. Uh, many non-parametric strategies are based on ranks of the data instead of the actual data. When data uh, when when there's a sample without unusual observations and a linear trend, uh, both the Pearson and the Spearman correlations tend to be similar. So we're going to notate the Spearman correlation based on ranks with R S for Spearman and the standard correlation with just R. So let's take a look at an example, and I believe we'll come back to this example later in this chapter, where we have eight patients, so it's a rather small sample size, that underweight, underwent a thyroid operation, and we measured three variables for each patient. There are actually many more, but this is a subset of the data. We have, and I'm going to zoom in on the data at this point, we have the person's weight in kilograms, we have the time in minutes that the operation lasted, and we have their blood loss in milliliters of blood. So 500 is half a liter of blood. And we want to know how does weight and time affect blood loss. And in particular, I think we're going to look at, yeah, we're interested in the factors that influence 
blood loss. Great. So we we'll read this data in. Read table is something I use all the time. You've seen it in previous chapters where I can include the text of the data set right in the right in the code and output it to a data frame directly, having to specify whether there's a header. Okay, so there's a header true. We look at the structure, everything looks correct for this data structure. We've got uh, eight observations, three variables, and these are the three variable names. All right, so there's the data. I just plotted it out, uh, put it in a table, I mean, and I'm going to now calculate correlations between these measurements. You know what? Let me jump down and look at a plot first. Um, it's much better to look at a plot first. <clears throat> so on the left are the original data. So this is a scatter plot matrix. We have weight, time, and blood loss on the vertical axis for those rows. And for the columns, we have the same variables, weight, time, and blood loss. Along the diagonal axis, we have the marginal distributions, uh, like histograms. Okay, so there's there's sort of a bunch of weights between 40 and 50, and then there's one observation out here at 70 for the weight. For time, there's almost a, you know there's a nice just nice fairly symmetric distribution in time, maybe slightly left skewed. Same thing for blood loss, slightly left skewed um, between 470 and 510. In the bottom left plots, there are there's a scatter plot of each pair of variables. I'm actually going to zoom in on this a little bit. And so, time is on the y-axis and weight on the vertical axis. I mean horizontal axis in this top left plot. And we can see that you know there's a little bit of a negative trend, but that depends largely on the single observation out here. Um, between blood loss and weight there seems to be a nice negative relationship here. And for blood loss, I'm sorry, blood loss and time, uh, it looks, maybe there's a slightly negative, maybe it's, maybe there's not really a relationship between time and blood loss. But wait, there seems to be a little bit of a negative relationship. In the upper right hand corner are the Pearson correlations between pairs of variables. So between weight and time, that is a negative 0 0.06, fairly small correlation. And that correlation corresponds to the diagonal plot time versus weight right here. So it's very, it's basically close to zero. For uh, this top right one, negative 0.7, that is in the far diagonal blood loss and weight in this plot. And that's that strong negative correlation. And finally, blood loss and time. So we have time and blood loss, negative 0.1. That's for this plot here, very weak negative correlation. So those are the Pearson correlations. Just to have a sense of what the Spearman correlations uh, look like is I have converted my, t my time, blood loss, and weight variables into ranks. All right, and so now you can see the points actually are unit distances away where, so if we look at, where's the easiest one to look at? Maybe this bottom left one. The rank weight goes across the horizontal. So there's, um, along the horizontal axis is one, and then two, three, four, five, and so on, six, seven, eight. And you can see the relative spacing on the left has been shifted to even spacing on the right. And then I've calculated the correlation value of the ranks, which appear in the in these corners. And you can see how they're different. In fact, the negative correlation became positive in this one uh, between rank time and rank weight. And the other two are, are similar to what they were before. So um, I wouldn't be I'm not actually very surprised about um, a distribution changing. That's just sort of the way it is. Let's see, I think, is there one? Yes. So there is one interesting feature for the rank blood loss. There was a tie for blood loss, and that tie is reflected in this 4.5 value. So these two values have the same rank along the vertical axis at 
and that's because whatever the middle value was was repeated. If we scroll up to the table, sorry, I'm jumping around. I'm zoomed in too far to. All right, so there must be two blood losses that had the same value, and that's this 490. So there was a tie, and the tie. So 490 was ranked fourth and fifth, and so we took the average rank of 4.5. All right, so that's pretty much how ranks work and how Spearman correlation works. There is a slight difference in, cor in how Spearman, cor cal Spearman correlation is actually calculated, but uh, the details are not uh, significant for us. All right, uh, this table is just a uh, set of the, the correlation table that we saw in the plot below. And notice you will sometimes get uh, comments when you have small sample sizes or ties that exact p-values can't be calculated. So with the Spearman uh, correlation, if you have tied values, you won't get an exact p-value. You'll get an approximation instead. Um, we, for practical purposes, won't care about that. All right, so we've seen the plot. We haven't seen this. Uh, function yet though. Um, so we've seen ggplot2 and ggalley is um, a an additional package that works with ggplot that gives us gg pairs and the pairs plot a pairs plot is another word for a scatter plot matrix which this is. So we've got rows and column which which are all the variables and then we have the univariate plots on the diagonal, the bivariate plots on an off diagonal, and there's other types of plots you can put on on the different off diagonals up top and down below, and we may see some of those, especially next semester when we're doing more plotting of this type. All right, so we've really investigated this data so far. Um, we have calculated the Pearson correlations and the Spearman. We've discussed the differences between those two, and uh, the one thing that we haven't done, do I have some p-values waiting out here for us? Ah, I see what I've done. Okay, so this code right here has calculated the the correlation values, p-core, which is the table on the left. And then I've also calculated the p-values for testing whether the correlation equals zero or not and those p-values appear on the right. So what we can do is we can look how does time and weight relate to each other. The Pearson correlation is negative 0.06 and the p-value for that is 0.8. It's a very large p-value. It's consistent with the null hypothesis that the data um, are drawn from a distribution with a zero correlation. For the second one, we've got blood loss and weight with a strong correlation and its p-value is 0 0.02. It's less than 0 0.05, and so we have a sufficient evidence to reject the null and conclude, in fact, that this correlation is different from zero, and perhaps we can make the additional claim that it's, it's likely to be strongly negative. So that's how to read those pairs of tables that I've created. And below, we did I did the same thing for the Spearman correlation. And even though the Spearman correlations are slightly different, we actually get the same inference. The, the one in the, the blood loss and weight is significant, while the other two are not significant. So it's nice. We've come to the same conclusion using two different strategies. That uh, result um, can make us feel more confident in our inference because we were able to both assume linearity and bivariate normal for the Pearson correlation and not make any model assumptions at all for the Spearman, yet our conclusions are the same. So it, it means that our conclusions don't depend on those assumptions that we were making. All right. That's a pretty uh, nice place to stop. So we'll come back and discuss simple linear regression in the next video.